Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's 12.30, so we're going to get started on today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. This webinar will last until 1.30. We'll try to end as on time as possible. And we're going to talk today about the Every Student Succeeds Act, or otherwise known as ESSA, and how this new federal education law can improve access to education for juvenile justice-involved youth. My name is Jenny Collier. I'm the Project Director of the Robert F. Kennedy Juvenile Justice Collaborative, and I'll be your moderator today. And we want to first thank our um, providers of the webinar service today and technical support, Open Society Foundation. We're very grateful to them and their um, support for today's event. So um, without further ado, let's get started. We have a pretty busy uh, schedule and a pretty tough, um, a lot to talk about. So first, I just want to let people know what will be happening. I'm going to do opening and intros very quickly. We're going to then hear a presentation by Josh Weber, one of our speakers, who's from the Council of State Government. Then we're going to have a panel discussion about the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, and that will include a presentation by an expert from NDTAC, which does uh, technical support for that law and Title I Part D. Then we're going to have a lot of time hopefully spent on participant Q&A. So please be thinking about what questions you might want to ask us. Questions will be taken in the chat box only, and we'll remind you of that later. But we are expecting up to 200 people to join today, and so we have decided to limit questions to the chat box only. I apologize for folks who might only be on the phone. It's just too unwieldy to do it um, unless you're signed in. And then. Um, we want to uh, make sure you know how to get us afterward. There will be contact information um, provided for questions that may come up afterward. If right now or later in the presentation you're having technical difficulties, please email Adam Clark. His email address is aclark at colliercollective.org, and it's at the bottom of the slide that's on the webinar right now. And for folks, who are on the webinar via their computer, you should be able to download today's presentation. So let's get started. First, I want to welcome our guests and our presenters. Um, as I mentioned, um, we have a, a limited time, so we're going to just do quick intros. And the bios are clickable um, by each person's name, so please feel free to read about them. Those should be live links. And we're going to start off today's presentation again with Josh Weber, who uh, serves as BSG Justice Center's Juvenile Justice Program Director, and he helps states focus on using effective methods to reduce recidivism and improve outcomes for youth in contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, Josh has had a lot of on-the-ground experience working in places such as Maryland and Chicago, as well as in the District of Columbia, helping to manage grants and do research on the issues relating to Youth development and juvenile justice systems. And so we really appreciate Josh you being here today. Um, in addition to Josh, who will do our first presentation, we have three panelists who have joined us today. The first one is Kate Burdick, who is a staff attorney from the Juvenile Law Center. And she focuses on advancing education rights and improving outcomes for youth in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. The area of expertise uh, for her includes school stability for youth in care unique special education issues, report-involved youth, educational decision-making, um, high-quality academics and career technical training for youth in facilities, and credit transfer and reentry issues. Um, so welcome, Kate. Simone Gonsolin also is here, who is the director of the National Technical Assistance Center for the Education of Children and Youth who are Neglected or Delinquent, otherwise known as NDTAC. And Simone also will be doing a special presentation for us about NDTAC and the technical uh, support they'll be giving to ESSA implementation. And he is the principal researcher for health and social development program for the American Institutes for Research, where he serves as the director of NDTAC. And NDTAC um, supports educational programming for neglected and delinquent youth and is funded by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, and before Joining NDTAC in his um, managerial role, Simon also worked uh, for the governor of Louisiana as the director of education for the Office of Youth Development, um, and then later as the governor's cabinet member um, 
Deputy Secretary of the Office of Youth Development. So he, again, also has lots of on-the-ground experience. Finally, Chris Scott will be here, and Chris is at the a Senior Policy Analyst at the Open Society Policy Center. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of him and his handsome mug, but he uh, joins us today, and at the center, he focuses on criminal, civil, and racial justice. And uh, he advocates for educational equity, reducing disparities, strengthening family structures, and increasing economic opportunity for vulnerable populations. Um, he also promotes the policy initiatives for OSF's Black Male Achievement Program and helps to convene the Justice Roundtable, which works to reform the U.S. criminal justice system. And prior to that, um, he's worked both at the Center for Law and Social Policy as well as a legislative fellow for Congressman Bobby Scott, who, as many of us know, is a champion for juvenile justice issues. Um, and so uh, I'm really pleased to have everybody today. And again, I'm at the RFK Juvenile Justice Collaborative. My name is Jenny Collier, and we work specifically on national youth reentry policy issues, including access to education. And so we're really glad to convene, today's, convene today's meeting so that we can really get to some practical questions and knowledge sharing around this new law and how it impacts the juvenile justice uh, system and the youth who enter it and return from it. So Josh, why don't you lead us off for a few minutes to talk about what uh, the Justice Center um, has done recently in terms of looking at the problem of access to education for youth in the juvenile justice system and some of the products that CSG has come up with that might help our listeners and participants today be able to better advocate for the need for these services and understand the limitations and difficulties people may have accessing them. Thanks, Jenny, and uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be with you. Um, next slide. Um, so just a little bit about the Council of State Government's Justice Center. We provide um, practical, nonpartisan, evidence-based advice to all three branches of government um, to help them improve recidivism rates and other outcomes for youth and adults in contact with the justice system. Next slide. So um, our juvenile justice program is very focused on helping state and local juvenile justice systems to adopt policies and practices based on research to reduce recidivism. But increasingly, um, policymakers and system leaders are focused not just on recidivism, but improving other key outcomes for youth. Um, and certainly one that stands out is improving educational outcomes. Um, as, a, as I'm sure many folks know, um, at the end of 2014, the Department of Education and Justice released a guidance package to states outlining um, some key principles for improving um, education for incarcerated youth. And so at the Justice Center, we're very interested in getting a sense of what are states really doing around improving educational and vocational outcomes for incarcerated youth, and what are some of their key challenges to really implementing these guiding principles in their facilities. Next slide. Hang on, sorry. I'm not able to advance the slides for some reason. There you go. Great. So one important piece of context to keep in mind um, as we think about trying to improve outcomes for incarcerated youth and um, the implications for ESSA is that um, the reality of incarcerated youth has changed dramatically over the last 15 years. So the good news is there are about half as many youth incarcerated, um, at least in 2013, as there were in 1997. Um, but the challenge is those youth are much more dispersed. So in 1997, the majority of young people were placed in state-run secure facilities. In 2013, actually, um, the highest proportion of young people are placed in privately run facilities, those run by a nonprofit or a for profit provider. Slightly less young people placed in state run facilities, and um, increasing number of young people incarcerated in locally run facilities. So, when we think about improving educational outcomes for this population, it means not just working with state facilities, but encompassing all of the different types of facilities where youth are incarcerated. Next slide. And the, the key challenge with you seeing in these many different placements is in most states, there's no single agency that's responsible for the education of youth in all of those facilities. 
what you see in this slide is in only six states is there a, is the juvenile justice agency responsible for education in all facilities. In only three states is it a single state or local education agency. Um, and in the majority of states, it's really a combination of state and local juvenile justice and education agencies, private providers, contractors, a whole host of organizations that are involved in the education of incarcerated youth. And so that means all of them will then need to be involved in trying to improve service delivery and outcomes for the population. Next slide. So to really get a better sense of um, what's the current reality for youth who are incarcerated, particularly uh, in the custody of state juvenile correctional agencies, we conducted a national survey with, and received responses from all 50 states that really focused on three main questions. What services are youth receiving in those facilities? What data is being collected in facilities around their educational and vocational outcomes? and what sort of supports are provided to those young people as they're transitioning back to the community, and what data is being collected on their outcomes. Um, at the end of 2015, we released an issue brief titled Locked Out that summarizes uh, a comprehensive set of findings on that survey and also has a detailed set of recommendations around uh, addressing the challenges raised by the survey. And I'm just going to give a very um, quick summary of those key findings today. Next slide. So the first key finding is that very few states are really providing incarcerated youth with the same educational and vocational services that would be available to youth in the community. Um, while many states were doing a reasonably good job of, of providing youth with a wide range of services in state-run facilities, when we look across all of the facilities that youth might be incarcerated in, few states were offering the full range of GED, PrEP, and recovery services, uh, career and vocational services, and post-secondary services. And so uh, in terms of meeting young people where they are and their specific educational needs and ensuring that uh, a wide range of services are available to youth who might be placed in a facility for a year or more, we can see from this data that very few states are really providing that full range of both educational and vocational services. Next slide. At the same time, we wanted to take a look at, um, given the, the huge emphasis for community schools on having um, statewide educational and accountability standards, to what extent are youth in the, who are incarcerated benefiting from those kinds of standards? And what you see here is that about um, 35 states, um, those facilities participate in the state educational accountability system and in about 30 states, their facilities receive national recognized accreditation for their education program. And when we look across those two metrics, it's less than half of the states that are ensuring that all of their facility curriculums are aligned with state accountability standards and that those facilities' education curriculum really is um, nationally accredited. And so still some significant work to do to make sure that not just youth receive the same services, but the rigor and quality of those services are the same as youth would receive in the community. Next slide. The second key finding was about data collection. Um, and again, we found that states were doing a reasonably good job about collecting data on educational and vocational progress and outcomes for youth in state-run facilities, but not nearly as good a job for youth who are in those privately-run facilities, keeping in mind that, again, the majority of incarcerated youth are now in those privately-run facilities. So when we asked states, 20% of states said that they collected the same data in their state-run facilities as in their privately-run facilities. 20% said they did not collect the same level of data. Um, and a little bit um, surprising and disappointingly, 60% of states actually said they didn't know at all what outcome data was being collected in the privately-run facilities where youth are placed in their custody. And so this really highlights that for many youth who are receiving educational services while incarcerated, the state custodial agency isn't really sure and isn't really holding those private providers accountable for making sure that youth are making sufficient educational progress and really knowing what the outcomes of youth are in those facilities so that they can be held accountable for appropriate progress. Next slide. Finally, the third key finding from the survey was that um, states are really struggling to make um, timely and appropriate uh, transitions from 
incarceration settings back to the community. And this is just one example of a key finding in that area. Um, what, what has been identified as sort of a clear best practice for many states is having dedicated education transition liaisons that can really help youth while they're incarcerated to make the connection back to an appropriate community school or some other kinds of educational and vocational um, programming given the complexities of all the different rules and regulations and need to transfer of um, credits and records back to the home school. And what we found from the survey is only 22% of states really have those ded dedicated education transition liaisons. In the other third of states, the state or local um, juvenile justice agency is responsible for that transition. Um, and um, of more concern is that in 45% of states, states reported really youth um, are left uh, mostly on their own to work through that transition, that it's either a parent's responsibility or a community-based organization's responsibility, um, but that there's no single person or no single agency identified to really help youth make that difficult transition from um, a school in confinement to an appropriate educational and vocational setting in the community. Next slide. Um, the, the other uh, key aspect of that transition process is to what extent the juvenile justice system is partnering with the educational system to make sure that youth are actually not just enrolling back in an appropriate educational vocational setting, but that they're making sufficient progress when um, they come back to the community. And this is one of the more disappointing findings of the survey. Um, what we found is that only 20 states, uh, again, the Juvenile Correctional Agency, report even knowing whether youth in their custody when they return back to the community is enrolled in school. And um, 17 states, whether our youth uh, received a GED, and then down the line with very few states actually tracking once um, these very generally high-risk youth who are incarcerated go back to the community, are they making educational progress? Are they earning some sort of credential? Are they enrolling in a job training program? And what this really highlights is the challenges that many states have given the patchwork of agencies responsible of trying to figure out between the juvenile justice and the education system who is responsible for these youth, how are we um, collecting data on their outcomes, and really how is that data being used to make sure juvenile justice and education agencies are collaborating together uh, to um, help youth really transition to a crime-free and a productive adulthood when they come back to the community. Next slide. Um, so that, that was just a quick summary of the survey findings, but based on those findings, we have some specific recommendations that we feel like all states and, and increasingly local systems who have incarcerated youth should really follow. Um, the first is that um, all facility schools, whether it's a state or a locally run school um, by a government agency or whether it's a contracted facility, should provide youth with access to the same educational and vocational services both across all of those different types of facilities as well as aligning that service delivery with the same sort of services that are available to youth in the community. Um, second is across all of those facility schools, the curriculum that youth are receiving really should be aligned with college and career readiness standards um, that students are being held accountable to in community schools across the state. Third is that um, there should be a minimum mandated set of student outcome indicators that are being tracked for youth um, while they're incarcerated um, that help um, custodial agencies really keep track of are youth making sufficient progress and are they making equal progress no matter what type of facility that they're uh, incarcerated in. Um, fourth is we found from the survey that not only are states struggling to really collect that data, but very few states are really analyzing the data and using it to evaluate and improve school performance. We know that data collection isn't an end in and of itself, but it's really a tool that agencies should be using to help facility schools improve and hold them accountable for results. Again, very similar to what's uh, happening in the community. Um, fifth is um, encourage um, all states and all facilities to have a, a single agency and ideally a single person in the form of transition liaison who can help you make that successful transition back to the community in an appropriate educational and vocational setting. And then finally, that states, and this really needs to happen at the state level, 
really identify a mandated set of outcome indicators that juvenile justice and education systems need to collaborate on to track whether youth are being successful back in the community. And those outcomes really should be reported um, to the state legislator, to the state ad advisory group, so that juvenile justice and education agencies can be held accountable for really working together to help improve these important outcomes for you. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. That was a terrific summary of all the wonderful work CSG has done recently to really help capture what a lot of practitioners on the phone have known about for a long time. So we really appreciate that and hope folks can use that material and contact us at the center, um, which is on this slide now, if you need additional assistance or if you're looking for um, the products that Josh described um, that um, he highlighted. So thank you. Um, so now we're going to go to our Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, panel discussion. And we're welcoming Kate Burdick, Simone Gossema, and Chris Scott to join us for that. And I'm just going to open really quickly by providing sort of an overview of where we are with this law. The law was passed by Congress in December, and now the Department of Education is in the process of trying to rigorously implement the law. And so what that means is that they're collecting information around implementation needs and questions that people have about the law. Many of us have um, signed on to public comments. Um, on both juvenile justice and child welfare population issues for the uh, law that hopefully the Department of Education will consider for regulation development. And um, there were public comments that Kate Burdick and I and others participated in um, that were collected in Washington and Los Angeles. Los Angeles. And then, um, you know, finally, we're trying to provide opportunities to get more information from the field by having this webinar and by staying in touch with people through a variety of listservs so that we can get a sense of what people's questions are or what some of the barriers might be to leveraging this new law to maximize opportunities for education for young people in the juvenile justice system as well as in the child welfare um, system when they are also duly involved. So I think that um, today will be a great kickoff for that, but we hope that today is not the end of the discussion because implementation of this law will not only involve the development of regulations, which will take several months, but potentially also guidances, which have a different legal status um, that will be used to advise uh, states and localities about implementation and other stakeholders like families. Um, families have an increased presence um, in this law. And uh, we hope that we, you will stay in touch with us and not only give us your questions today, but then also um, stay in touch with us uh, throughout this process in the coming months to implement ESSA as rigorously as possible. I want to start um, our discussion, though, by um, having Simon kick us through some of the um, role that NDTAC will be playing on um, helping to implement the law and provide technical assistance specifically on Title I Part D, which is the part of the law many of us worked on um, that very much impacts this uh, group of young people. So, Simon, do you want to take us through that, please? Thanks. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Jenny. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be on the webinar today and, and to share some information about NDTAC. Uh, NDTAC is short for the National Technical Assistance Center for the Education of Neglected or Delinquent Children and Youth. Um, it is currently housed at the American Institutes for Research. We were fortunate enough to receive the contract again, so we're very, very excited about the work, to take the work from the last contract and move it forward. Uh, a little bit about our mission, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we provide resources uh, and uh, direct technical assistance to states uh, who are engaged in the education of children and youth who are neglected and delinquent. And our primary audience there are our neglected and delinquent state coordinators. Uh, and I see from the list of uh, people who are, who are participating, there are a couple of coordinators on the call, so I want to say a special hello uh, to you, if you don't mind me taking that, that liberty there. Also, uh, one of the other things that we're engaged in is helping the states uh, to report their data around Title I Part D programming and uh, to help them take a look at that data uh, so they can do a better job of evaluating it, be it just one component of maybe their quality assurance uh, efforts there in the state, but certainly looking at their data both from a national level, uh, individual state level, and they can compare themselves to the national average and that sort of thing 
to determine what sort of steps they need to take to improve programming or continue to enhance it. And then finally, the, the third mission is to really uh, serve as a facilitator to increase information sharing, peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, across the country. And of course, being on a webinar today is an example of information sharing. And then one of the things that we do with our coordinators is we have our uh, neglected delinquent uh, community of practice. And, uh, and with this community of practice, we uh, afford coordinators the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, issues they may be having, uh, successes they're having. Uh, we bring to them uh, certain topical calls and topical information on these calls, but mainly it's a place for people who are doing the same job as a neglected, uh, neglected delinquent state coordinator to come together and really talk about what are the issues that they are uh, grappling with in their jobs. The next slide really talks a little bit about Title I Part D, which of course is a subsection of ESS, ESSA. Uh, and and uh, Title I Part D is, is designed to ensure that youngsters who are neglected or delinquent have the same opportunities as, as any other youngster who is enrolled in school, that they do meet the same challenging state academic standards and whether they are receiving schooling in the community, detention, or within a secure setting, or within an alternative school or the public school setting in the community. Also, we want to make sure that Title I Part D uh, dollars are used to improve educational services uh, for youth who are neglected, delinquent, at risk, and mainly those kids who are involved in the juvenile justice system. Also, to provide support and services needed to make the successful transition from uh, uh, institution to school to employment. Uh, and uh, there are some changes in the law actually here. Uh, that uh, Jenny and others on the call will go over a little bit later uh, that are really interesting and very exciting. As Josh said, uh, you know, he's, uh, with the CSG report, um, there's so much emphasis being placed on those transition coordinators, right, to really uh, assist in getting records when the youngster arrives at the facility, staying in touch with the youngster in the school while he is, in fact, uh, enrolled in school at the facility, and then assisting uh, with uh, a good return to the community, whether that be a vocational program, academic program, uh, or the world of work. Uh, another uh, component of Title I Part D is, of course, to prevent uh, youth um, who, who are at risk of academic failure from ever dropping out of school. And, of course, this is, uh, there are two subparts to Title I Part D, the subpart, subpart one, subpart two. The subpart two uh, section of, of Title I Part D is really the prevention and intervention component of, of uh, the, the funding and the programming. And then also to provide children who have dropped out of school that opportunity to return to school with the support system needed so that they can continue their education. And as I mentioned a little earlier, if you can go to the next slide, there are two subparts to Title I Part D. And um, yeah, this next slide shows this sort of in a diagram, and I'll take you through this very, very quickly. Uh, and there are two very separate programs with different guidance uh, and different regulations on how the dollars can be spent and what they can be spent on and what sort of programs uh, can, be, can be offered and where they can be spent. So if you look at state agency programs, which are subpart one programs, the ones at the top of your screen there, the U.S. Department of Education allocates funds uh, for this subpart to state educational agencies based on the number of children and youth in state-operated facilities, and the state's average per pupil educational expenditure is also part of that formula. Once Ed determines a state's subpart one allocation, the state educational agency makes subgrants to eligible state agencies uh, who, who participate based on either one, one of two ways. One is um, they get a proportionate share of the state's ad adjusted enrollment count of children and youth who are Part D eligible, or they have a program that is of highest need. So that's always where some confusion comes in. Uh, a, a lot of folks think that every every state-operated juvenile, uh, juvenile justice facility receives Title I Part D dollars, and that is not accurate because the states have the discretion to determine where to spend these dollars because they are limited dollars uh, as to where the highest need may exist. So so they justify why they've selected facility A, B, and C, but not facilities, you know, F and, and G 
to to provide uh, services uh, for, for kids under Title One Part D. And then the second subpart uh, is Subpart Two, uh, and this is to local agency programs. Uh, and here, Ed allocates funds for this subpart to state educational agencies based on our annual caseload data of the number of children and youth living in local facilities for delinquent children and adult, <clears throat> excuse me, and adult correctional facilities. The SEA has the option of awarding subgrants to eligible local educational agencies or LEAs by formula or through a discretionary grant process. So many states are uh, actually using a competitive sort of approach to award sub part $2 uh, to local uh, educational agencies. Okay, and the next slide is just some final information about NDTAC. Uh, the, the type of assistance that we give uh, state Part D coordinators, we provide direct technical assistance uh, via our state layers. As we have three layers on to provide technical assistance to the 50 uh, NAD coordinators around the country. Uh, we do this uh, through um, phone calls, webinars, products, but mainly staying in touch with these individuals. We offer both proactive and reactive TA. So if a TA request comes in from a coordinator, we respond to it, but then we also make efforts to contact the coordinators. Uh, to determine whether they're having issues or those sorts of things uh, in sort of a proactive manner. Uh, I have a feeling once we do get clear guidance from the Department of Education on ESSA, uh, we'll have many, many calls with coordinators uh, around both direct uh, and proactive TA. Um, also, we provide technical assistance uh, by our data team at NDTAC for uh, the collection of data, especially around the CSPR data collection. Peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction via ND communities, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, it's our community of practice, uh, both an opportunity for the coordinators to speak amongst them, themselves, but also we offer topical calls where we provide uh, some pertinent content, uh, content uh, that uh, we feel as though may help them to build capacity and, and uh, move their, their programs in the, uh, the direction they want them to go. Also, we offer products and resources, webinars, and our website is located here at the bottom of the, of the uh, slide there. So please uh, visit our website uh, and uh, have access to our products uh, and um, also webinars that will be coming up uh, this, this year. Thanks, Jenny. That's a quick overview of NDTAC. Thanks so much, Simon. We really appreciate it, and I think we'll all be getting in touch with NDTAC as the year moves forward. Um, now we're going to move to our panel discussion um, with Simone, Kate, and Chris. And Josh, feel free to jump in if there's a question, obviously, that comes in related to the information you um, discussed. But we're first going to hear a little bit from Kate about a fact sheet and some of the that helps to encapsulate um, some of the key findings of this new law, ESSA, and how it will help expand access to education for young people in and returning from the juvenile justice system. The fact sheet was co-developed by Juvenile Law Center, Open Society Policy Center, and RFK Juvenile Justice Collaborative, my organization, as well as several other organizations. It was a collaborative effort. You can download the fact sheet while we're talking from the slide. We also sent it out to all registered participants uh, before the webinar began, I believe, this morning. So um, please feel free to take a look at it. And if you have questions about that, there's a way to get in touch with us on the fact sheet, or of course you can use the email provided at the end of this um, presentation. And so, Kate, why don't you kick us off now um, with kind of a broad-based, high-level summary of the good things we were able to achieve in our advocacy on um, improving ESSA for um, the community of youth we're talking about today. Thanks, Jenny, and um, thank you to all of you for tuning in today, especially those in the Northeast who are still recovering from snowstorms this past weekend, so I'm glad so many people could join today. As Simone was saying, Title I Part D, that's not new to, in ESSA. That you know, structure has existed um, with its goal of improving educational services for children who are you know, considered neglected and delinquent under the law. Um, but what the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, was able to do was put in some language that we think is strong. Um, that is more specific about how uh, those needs should be met, and specifically um, there's a lot around improving transitions in education, both now into facilities 
um, and coming out of facilities. And the law tends to use the term correctional facilities, but it actually is defined pretty broadly. I know there are some states that really don't use that term, um, but that's what Title I Part D um, uses as a general rule. Um, but don't think that when we use that term, we are only referring to, I think, what, what some people might think is a more limited subset of facilities. Uh, and I'll just say really fast some of the main gains and then give you an opportunity to look at the fact sheet later or follow up with questions because I know we want to leave time for a little bit of discussion on today's webinar and hear from you all what your concerns are about implementation. But some of the gains include um, an increased protection around educational assessments when youth enter a facility. Um, so this basically already we had in the law a requirement of doing educational assessments. What ESSA put into place is uh, a, a protection for or really an emphasis on doing this right away when a youth comes into a facility when practicable. And w that's important because it means when young people come into facilities, their educational needs should be assessed as soon as possible so that it's all the more likely that their needs are going to be met while they're in the facility. And that's something we actually heard a lot in the field that kids were not having, not being identified for uh, special education needs or other services that they could have been provided while in the facility because nobody knew. Records transfer, of course, is an ongoing issue, making sure that those education and related records transfer with the student. And ESSA puts in a few requirements that say that uh, facilities have to work with the youth's family and the local educational agency to make sure that those relevant records transfer to and from the facility. Um, Reentry planning is another very important thing and actually something that was in the December 2016 guidance that the uh, Department of Ed and Department of Justice jointly put out. Um, that it's really important to start that reentry process early. There's an emphasis on that in ESSA a as well, then um, they have to work between the correctional facility and the local educational agency to coordinate services so kids don't fall through the cracks and to minimize disruption when they're coming out of correctional facilities. Credit transfer is another big point in the law that um, the state educational agency has to ensure the timely transfer of credits. Huge issue I'm sure many of you have encountered. And we all know that when young people think they're in 12th grade and then they come out and they find out, oh, uh, we're not going to take your credits, um, you're actually in ninth grade, that is hugely discouraging. So having this protection to require um, timely transfer of credits is really important to keeping kids on the right level and in, in you know, going to graduate on time and engaged in school. Um, and then there's a lot in here about appropriate enrollment, making sure that when students leave correctional facilities that they are timely re-enrolled in an appropriate placement that best meets their needs. That language is in the law that best meets their needs. We think that's really imp important because we know that there are often delays in re-enrollment or that local education agencies um, are automatically placing kids in alt-ed programs or other types of programs that don't meet their needs. So having that language and acknowledgement that it's supposed to be best, what's best for the child uh, is really important. Um, timely is not defined in the law, but I certainly would interpret it to mean immediately. Um, and we hope that's something that the uh, Department of Ed will clarify. Um, and that states are also required to make sure that when students are re-entering that they have really robust educational opportunities, um, the opportunities to earn credit, to have career and technical and education programming, post-secondary education programming if that's what's appropriate for them. Um, and finally, I'll just say that there is also an increased emphasis in ESSA on access to a regular high school diploma. And this is, I think, really stemming from a concern that some facilities, and you may even remember one of the early slides on the CSG report, you know, some facilities are offering GED programs, they may not be offering other programming, and so students may be pushed into GED programs even if it would be better for them or more appropriate for their particular situation to receive a an, an regular high school diploma. Um, so this is just another way that ESSA is recognizing that services need to be individualized and that we need to keep 
our juvenile justice involves students in you know regular credit bearing challenging courses that will allow them to have the same degree of educational success as kids in the community. Um, and there are a few other things that the SSA does, but I'm not going to go into every single one right now, but I wanted to give you a broad overview and I hope that we can talk more about what some of your concerns are. Great, Kate. Thank you so much for that really great top line summary of some of the good news that we have now with this new education law. Um, Chris, I wanted to not limit the conversation just to Title I Part B, which is the fact sheet and which Kate's discussion summarized, but wanted to also give you an opportunity um, to briefly add any other highlights from ESSA that impact um, youth involved in or returning from the juvenile justice system potentially and could help support them so that people can keep their eyes and ears open about how to use those portions of the law, please. Yep, and in the interest of time, I'll be really short and brief, so I just want to highlight three additional things for folks on the phone and on the webinar. Um, and hi, my name is Chris Scott. Thanks for that, Jenny. Um, so the first thing is that, you know, ESSA now gives an opportunity for schools to really address school climate and school discipline in a way that they hadn't before. And while it's not mandatory, it is optional, but it's a step in the right direction um, in terms of looking at better data collection for school climate and school discipline. So one provision within ESSA that's new is that um, there's a provision for school climate to be used as an indicator of, indicator of school quality or student success that would be measured annually. And so what that means is that it allows schools to use indicators that, diff that states can choose from to measure school quality and student success, which includes performance on annual assessments, um, four-year graduation rate cohorts, um, progress of English language proficiency. Um, the other optional indicators of school quality or student success that should be included um, by a state include student engagement, educator engagement, student access to completion of advanced coursework, post-secondary readiness, and then school climate and safety. I think the last two are important because they, all, they dovetail with some of the Title I Part D provisions um, in that those individuals who are incarcerated that are coming back out of incarceration and returning, and who will be promptly, promptly re-enrolled into a traditional um, into a traditional educational setting, will have to look at whether or not their post-secondary readiness and what the overall school climate and safety guidelines are to help them become better engaged. Um, the other, the other, the, the second provision that I want to highlight is that it now provides more funding. Um, and flexibility around funding for school-wide positive behavior interventions and support. Um, this, is, this is particularly important for students who are attending schools that don't often have their needs met, but also students with disabilities, um, and that will help them provide better wraparound supports and services um, for those students. And the last thing is just the comprehensive needs assessment provision. Um, that provision allows both LEAs and SEAs, which are state educational agencies and local educational agencies, um, to co conduct a comprehensive needs assessment to examine needs for improvement, whether that's around school climate, um, school discipline, or if it's looking at uh, ways to personalize learning experiences for individuals who are deemed, um, who, who, whose academic needs aren't getting aren't being met or being provided, um, and it also looks at developing the application process for funding through consultation with parents, teachers, principals, other school leaders, students, community-based organizations, and local government representatives um, to really focus in on what the needs are for the students attending that particular school. So those are three overarching provisions um, that I think are impactful and actually dovetail with the Title I Part D um, provisions in a very profound way to help youth um, reintegrate um, into school and actually have positive educational outcomes. There are other things related to school discipline and climate and other things related to um, improving educational opportunities and funding opportunities uh, for, for, for low income um, and urban, school, or, or urban kids and students with disabilities who aren't having their needs met. Um, but if you have questions, feel free to email me, and we're also going to be working on a fact sheet around some of the school discipline and climate provisions within ESSA. Um, hopefully we can get that out to folks um, by the end of February. So thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Chris. And again, um, we really appreciate getting a, a, a sense of the other types of protections and opportunities that ESSA now provides outside of Title I Part D. So um, people should definitely feel free to ask Chris questions about the material he presented as well. Um, we're now to uh, the Q&A portion. Um, to ask a question, we're going to ask that you please type your question into the webinar chat box. We will not be taking questions from the phone only. I'm sorry. Um, it just isn't technically that easy with over 200 people signed into the webinar right now. Um, and we also wanted to get a transcript of all the questions asked today. So please post your question to everyone, not me, um, so that we can save that transcript and people can see what's going on in the chat box and also so that we can get back to people potentially through um, questions we may end up researching and, and sharing with the large community that we pulled together for this webinar and on the many listservs that we work with on education, reentry, and other juvenile justice related issues. So I want to kick off for the panel um, something that came in a little bit while ago um, that I think is really helpful. And it was a question about um, uh, from Kathy Seismarek um, about how whether there are different um, access points to Title I Part D support for people in um, do these new provisions affect programs differently for incarcerated students if they're incarcerated at different durations. She offers 30 days, 90 days, six months, and one year or longer. But I think the question really is about, you know, if as we, you know, seek to incarcerate youth age appropriately and for less and less amounts of time, do the time limits of their um, custodial um, days or placements really change what they might be eligible for? And so I wanted to see if um, Kate and Simone maybe wanted to try to address that question, please. Sure, this is Kate. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this is a question actually that we have heard from several jurisdictions in the past week almost um, that is potentially an issue and um, I think Simone will have some more uh, concrete guidance on this. What I can say is that I know that there are some jurisdictions that are concerned that they have been not able to access Title I Part D funding because their length of stay is less than 30 days. And actually, as we know, there are wonderful efforts around uh, reducing length of stay and, and reducing detention times going on across the country. And it would be a, a rude irony if that resulted in less education funding. So this is something that certainly piqued our interest. Um, I, there is no such requirement in the black letter law of Title I Part D. There was guidance put out by Department of Education in 2006 following No Child Left Behind, which is the previous iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that did limit um, funding uh, under subpart one of Title I Part D to institutions that had a length of stay longer than 30 days. But as Simone will tell you, uh, funding issues like this are more complex than meets the eye, and so I know that NDTAC is available as a resource um, to answer specific questions for jurisdictions wondering about whether or not they can access the funds, um, and they can contact him directly with those type of questions, and he'll get it to the right NDTAC liaison. Um, but I do want folks on this call to be aware that um, I, Jenny, and other advocates are, are aware of this and want to make sure to work with Department of Education and um, others involved in implementation of ESSA to the extent that we can to try to get clarity on this moving forward because I don't see that requirement in the uh, letter of the law myself. Thanks, Thank Kate. You. Simon? Yeah, hey, hey, Jenny. Thanks, Kate. I appreciate that. First of all, I want to apologize to you. I'm fighting the code that one of my grandchildren lovingly gave to me. And, uh -huh. uh, and and certainly any anything that I share with you today is Simal's opinion uh, and and is not the the opinion of the Department of Education. But as Kate said, you are more than welcome to email me directly, and I'll give you that email address in just a second, uh, and ensure that your question goes to the correct liaison. And if it's a use of funds sort of question, typically what we have done is we have taken our response to this request, 
send it on to the Department of Ed to make sure that the Department of Ed feels comfortable with our response so that, you know, when you go back to either make decisions or, or uh, to suggest changes in the way things are done in your state, that, in fact, uh, you have, you know, some, some pretty good solid information there uh, to, to do that. Uh, we also include our neglected and delinquent state coordinator in the response so they know, you know, what's going on and, and certainly if there's anything they can do to assist you, then certainly they, they would. Um, I mean, the only, the only thing I can, I can add to what Kate has said uh, for this particular question is, you know, it, it always depends on whether or not you're looking at support two funds or support one funds. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the, there are requirements around in the guidance from the Department of Ed that uh, Subpart 1 funds were always intended for youth and programs of a longer term because these are supplemental funds that uh, in the longer term facilities, uh, the expectation is that there is a high quality educational program in existence and that the Title I Part D Subpart 1 dollars are in fact used to supplement that program take it to the next level, add some additional uh, resources so, so that the program's a little more comprehensive uh, and can maybe, you know, add some things that maybe the state doesn't even allow uh, in using state dollars. So, you know, oftentimes federal dollars are a little more flexible than maybe your state dollars. So, so that was the intent and the spirit behind Title I Part D, Subpart 1, while Subpart 2 does not have that supplant clause. It's not, they don't have the supplement supplant clause in it like Subpart 1 does. And, and uh, so, so there is a little more, uh, I guess, fluidity in the ability to be able to use these dollars. And certainly for, for children who are in detention centers who are in there, and we know most children in detention centers for under 30 days, you know, there is no reason why uh, a detention center could not utilize Subpart 2 dollars unless the state has made the decision, because the state has some discretion, they have broad discretion here, that uh, there are other programs that are of greater need. So, so it could be something within the state's plan, uh, and, and as they implement the, the plan, that's when this question comes in, and they end up denying the request because within their plan they've identified programs of potentially higher need uh, for, these, for these dollars. Uh, as a matter of fact, what will occur within the next year since um, ESSA has, has been uh, reauthorized, uh, states will have to complete a new plan. So as Jenny and, and Chris and Kate mentioned earlier, you know, now is the time, so to speak, to impact the state plans. Uh, so I think you know, as soon as the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, provides a little more guidance around these changes, and, and uh, can, can assist us with, with making some, some calls here, I think that's a good time for you then to interact with your state educational agency and your neglected and delinquent state coordinator who will be writing a state plan to address uh, how the state plans on using Title I Part D dollars in both Subpart 1 and Subpart 2 uh, programming. Great. Thanks so much. Um, this is a very technical uh, question and you know Simone's email we put on the chat box for everybody and we'll make sure that in the final edition of the webinar slides that we include contact information for folks and we'll email those out to all registrants um, of the webinar. So if you don't get it on the chat box you should get it in your email box in the webinar slides that you'll get after the webinar um, is completed. Um, I want to go to another question. We are getting a lot of questions, so if you don't hear your question being um, asked, uh, please make sure that you've sent it to the chat box um, to everyone, so that will be part of our transcript, and we can try to follow up. And as we do the um, activities we're going to do, advocating for the most robust implementation and um, share information as we get it. Um, this is a question from April Marchev. Um, we have a history with one local school district that tends to place children returning from placement, voluntary agencies, or state agencies on home-based tutoring, which is typically two hours a day. This school district typically does not accept the children back into the school district. Is there a legal way to fight this process? And I think in addition to that part of the question I want to add for the panel, you know, ESSA really does um, say that youth are 
um, supposed to be placed in, you know, the best educational fit program for them. And so, um, you know, what is the best way to get around these kinds of alternative school placements or um, home school placements that um, school districts may adopt as a one-size-fits-all policy for students? This is Kate. And um, I will just say also, similar to Simone, my disclaimer of this is not legal advice. Um, and I'm speaking as my own opinion, um, but this, you know, scenario certainly raises a lot of red flags for me, um, particularly if those students are students who, who qualify as having a disability under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I think that there are some real legal remedies that could be pursued. Um, and it, regarding Title I Part D, again, I, you know, it might be that this is a a local school district that is receiving funds under Title I Part D. It might be that it's a local school district that's not receiving funds under Title I Part D. Um, but I would be happy to, to troubleshoot um, particular questions like this offline. Um, and my email is kburdick at jlc.org. And, um, and, and there was another, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, Go I'm, ahead. So this is Chris Scott. I, I also echo. Um, what Kate just said with respects to if this student is a student with disabilities under IDEA, there are some legal remedies. Um, don't take anything I say as legal advice as well. But I, and the other point I want to make is if you can show that this is having a disparate impact or being disproportionately, um, you know, assigned to students of color, then you may have some other legal remedies as well, and you could also file. Um, a civil rights complaint with either with the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights um, with, with respect to this, because this this looks at it looks like another way for a school or school district to push students out of school, those that um, traditionally don't fit the mold of, of of what they deem to be a, a student that should be getting services from um, the school. So I think those are two avenues that you could have to, to fight this and try to remedy this. Um, but, yeah, we, we oftentimes see this with students who have behavioral problems where they're sent home, um, you know, for an hour or two out the day and oftentimes don't come back because they have no other way to get back to school. And it's just a different form of pushing them out without actually having to document it because you aren't suspending or expelling them. Thanks, Chris. Those are important additions of tools that people can use. And um, again, you know, the spirit of the law is, is for this for Title One Part D um, and other parts that Chris has mentioned is really to make sure that um, kids now re-entering or um, coming from the juvenile justice system um, have as much individualized placement as possible. And so, you know, ESSA has been improved that way, but, you know, it's up to us to make sure it's robustly implemented and that people understand um, the tools and the enforcement provisions. And we're going to be learning a lot about that because um, regulations are getting developed now. We don't know what they're going to look like. There will be opportunity for public comment, and I think our community is going to need to pay attention to that process so that we can push the most robust enforcement and accountability standards, um, and as well as implementation of individualized educational plans when possible, and you know, for the both students with disabilities as well as other students um, coming out of the system. There's and Jenny, there question. was a oh sorry, just Go as ahead. a follow up to that, there was a question about how if there's information like this on how all you know this mm -hmm. new law applies to students with disabilities. And then Simone gave a really great uh, resource that's on the ND Tech website. They have a lot of um, information there, past webinars about meeting the needs of youth with special educational needs who are involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, but I'll also say, you know, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and other federal laws applying to students with disabilities, you know, remain in place. And the correctional education guidance that Departments of Ed and Justice put out in December 2014 very includes a dear colleague letter on that and very clearly says that they apply to youth who are um, involved in the system and inside correctional facilities. So um, those types of protections are still in place. We didn't highlight them today because we were focusing mainly on Title What Part D and some of the school climate issues that Chris talked about, um, but those certainly would still apply. That's right. That guidance, many of the folks on the phone have helped to support and 
um, sign on to recommendations for that guidance. It's very important. It was a very strong set of documents, and we should all continue to use that to inform our, you know, the system and the systems we work with at home as well as Department of Education of what we want and how the system should actually work, especially during this time before ESSA is robustly implemented. Um, I just want to do one more uh, question because we're running out of time. It's 1.30, but we'll do one last one. And I think it's about credit. Um, and it said, you know, they're having trouble because kids are in for shorter stays in the school year. They're having trouble getting folks um, in the schools that the kids return to to accept partial credit. And the law doesn't exactly address partial credit, but I wonder maybe we should describe some of the issues around um, credit and coursework, um, Kate, that the law does address. Sure. Um, so state educational agencies basically are required to ensure the timely transfer of credits earned while in juvenile justice placements under, for, you know, states that are receiving Title I Part D funding. And that doesn't necessarily spell out how to do that. Um, but I think there are some jurisdictions around the country that um, have made a lot of progress in this area. I know, for example, New York City has a credit transfer and partial credit transfer policy. Um, that helps figure out how you calculate all of that when a student returns from placement. Um, and so, and we can certainly put together some other models to um, demonstrate how uh, a facility and local educational agency can work together to, to make this happen. Um, there are also some places that, for example, are doing more like modular, short-term credit bearing um, courses when students are inside facilities so that you don't have to be there for eight months in order to get any credits, um, that you can earn credits faster through those modular programs or through um, credit recovery programs. And certainly the last thing we want is for kids to be kept in placement and in the juvenile justice system longer just so that they can get educational benefits. We think that they should be in the community as much as possible getting that education. We just want to make sure that when their system involved that continues and that they are smoothly able to transition back into um, an appropriate program in the community with those credits. Um, so the, the law addresses it, but I don't think it gets into the nuts and bolts as much as the questioner is wondering about. Um, but certainly if that's something that people are interested in, we can put together some um, helpful materials. And ND Tech probably as well has some information about jurisdictions using ND funds that are um, doing that well. Yes, and Kate, can I add to that? Oh, sorry. Yes, please. No, so please, this is Simone. Yeah. If, if you look at the, the new law uh, under Section 1414, under state plans, and this is something that your state educational agencies are going to have to be engaged in within the next year because of, of the reauthorization, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of emphasis placed on transition. But I'm going to read something to you, and I think it gets at maybe the heart of what the question dealt with. And, and as I said earlier, now is the time, so to speak, to talk with – uh, your state education agent because they're going to have to write this plan and they're going to have to address this very issue of transfer credits. It says that within this plan they have to provide assurances that the state education agency has established procedures to ensure the timely re-enrollment of each student who has been placed in the juvenile justice system in secondary schools or in a re-entry program that best meets the needs of the student, including, and here you go, the transfer of credits that such students earn during placement and the opportunities for such students to participate in credit-bearing coursework while in secondary schools, post-secondary education, or career educational programs. So the states will have to write some assurance in their state plan as to how they're going to receive these credits from the, from the juvenile justice uh, facility schools. That's great, you, Simone. You can Thank influence that. that, right? This is the yeah. time. Yep. This is the time to do that. That's exactly right. And also, I want to uh, refer people back to um, Simone's slide and ND TAC. There was another question about, for example, Simone, um, the requirements that transition specialists are supposed to have, you know, to be able to work in that type of job. Do you guys have anything like that online that provides guidance for, how, you know, some best practices for transition specialists? We do. We actually have a, a job description online uh, for a transition oh, specialist. Uh, so, yeah, folks just go to, to the topical area of transition. 
uh, and, and you can find there's, uh, there's several webinars uh, that are archived, uh, and uh, we actually have a couple of states uh, transition uh, coordinators or educational advocates um, um, brochures on there, including Washington State, which is one of the oldest uh, that, that has been operational in the country that I'm aware of that actually started out as a pilot using Title I Part D dollars. That's right, and actually RFK, General Justice Collaborative, actually has an archived webinar that we did that features that, and so we can maybe get that out of the um, archive and make sure people have access to that. So um, we've come to uh, an hour and five minutes now, so I want to end in respect for everyone's time, including both our presenters and our participants. We will leave the chat box open for a few more minutes, so if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, or if your question got an answer, please rest assured we want to see your questions and we'd like to research them and get back to people as possible and possibly use your question as a way to inform the greater community. So please take a moment to type your question in the chat box to everybody so we can try to save a transcript of it. And um, I want to thank everyone um, for joining us today. I want to thank our panelists who did a fantastic job. If anybody has additional questions and um, needs to be answered um, very quickly, please email Adam Clark. His email is right here. I want to thank Adam um, in my office as well as Jasmine Nickens and um, Open Society Foundations for all of their work and support to make today possible. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the week, and we look forward to staying in touch with you as we work together to improve access to education for youth involved in and returning from the juvenile justice system. Thanks so much again.